Presented by Caltech. The vertical axis is the limiting error rate, which is generally going to be your two qubit error rate. This horizontal line is at 1%, and that's the threshold for service code error correction, which is the type of error correction which we are pursuing, although there are other uh, codes that are out there. And we're pursuing this research direction that's plotted in red, where we're trying to expand to larger systems, but also bring down this limiting error rate. And it's important to focus on both of those, both the number of qubits and also this limiting error rate, and trying to get rid of errors as much as we can. Now, until very recently, almost all quantum computing experiments, or maybe all quantum computing experiments, have been locked in this classically simulatable realm. And this quantum supremacy experiment is really the first time that we step out of that realm into something new and different. Uh, and what we're entering into is this blue shaded area here. And this is an interesting area. We'll talk about NISC a bit more in a moment. But it's something that's kind of in between the physics experiments that groups have been working on over the past several decades and this useful error-corrected quantum computer down <laughs> here in the corner. It's going to be a long path to the useful error-corrected quantum computer. And we hope that we'll be able to find some very interesting physics and applications for quantum computing inside of this blue triangle that we have just stepped into with this device. So welcome, everyone, to the NISC era. This is a term that you all will be familiar with because, of course, it was coined by John Preskill here at Caltech. And this means noisy intermediate scale quantum. This refers to quantum processors with perhaps 50 to a few hundred qubits and with noisy gates and no error correction. So this is the world that we have just stepped into. And let me mention as an aside that we have an open source project called CERC, which is a Python framework for working on NISC algorithms. So if you're interested in this, uh, please check out CERC. Now this is a plot of the gate errors across our Sycamore processor. And I will explain later the details of how we acquire all of this data. Um, but this is really the, the signifying factor that shows we are in this NISC era, where we have 50 plus qubits. They can all work together with simultaneous operations. <laughs> and we have pretty good connectivity across this two-dimensional array, although there are errors associated with every operation. So if you're trying to run a real algorithm, you're going to have to be careful and, and do some real, real work to try to mitigate those errors with the technology that we have. I want to re-emphasize that this is a huge team effort, and I'm really I'm so thrilled that I get to be a part of this team and that I get to share their results with you today. Um, so thanks a lot to, to all of these people here. For the rest of my talk, I'll be following this outline. So we're going to look at four main areas. The first is I want to give you a flavor for how superconducting qubits work, because I realize we have a, a well-educated quantum information audience here, but maybe I can give you a review of how transmons work and what the data really looks like. Second, I want to talk specifically about the Sycamore device and the key innovations that allow us to actually get this thing to work. Third, I want to talk about calibration. And this is a crucial process of going from all of the hardware that we have and to do physics experiments to figure out exactly how we can run quantum algorithms. And finally, I want to discuss benchmarking, which is where this data comes from. It's how we decide how well we're doing with our device. So let's get started with superconducting qubits. Now, at the heart of any superconducting qubit is a Josephson junction. We love Josephson junctions. And the essence of a Josephson junction is we have two pieces of superconductor which have a thin insulating barrier between them. And that's depicted in a schematic here on the left and in an electron microscope image of a real Josephson junction that I made with my own hands on the right. So here there is a bottom layer of aluminum. It's got some of this kind of cruft around it. Pay no mind. And then the top aluminum layer is deposited across. So they make kind of a cross. And there's a very thin layer of aluminum oxide between them which separates the two pieces of superconductor. And the two superconductor pieces can have different phases, and Josephson observed that that difference in phase is crucially related to the voltage across the junction and the current through the junction. So this is kind of like Newton's laws for Josephson junctions. But the reason that we love Josephson junctions so much is we can use them to make a nonlinear inductor. So this is going to be a superconducting circuit element. It's dissipationless, but it gives us a nonlinear inductance, and that's going to be key to actually making a qubit. So we, can, we know the inductance is related to how the voltage and the time derivative of the current interact. So we can substitute these guys in and get this expression for the inductance. So we have a factor here that is just the, from the physical properties of the device. And then we have this interesting factor here. This says the value of the inductance depends on the amount of current that is flowing through it. 
So if you excite a circuit that has this junction in it, then there's a different amount of current flowing through the junction, and the value of the inductance changes. This is going to be essential to our qubit. Now, we use transmon qubits. This is an example of a superconducting qubit. And of course, there's a vast zoology of superconducting qubits that you may be familiar with, uh, composed of different combinations of capacitors and junctions and linear inductors. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the transmon today because it's the one that we're using in the Sycamore device, and it's also one of the most elegant and widespread superconducting qubits. The essence of the transmon is that it is a nonlinear superconducting oscillator. And you may be familiar with a capacitor in parallel with an inductor to make an oscillator. Well, here we simply replace the inductor with our nonlinear inductor that is made of one or two Joseph's injunctions. In this case, there are two. That's a bit of a detail, because if we change the magnetic flux that is threading that loop, we can change the frequency of the oscillator, which is a very nice feature that we use, but not every group does that. On the right are microscope pictures that show you what this really looks like in real life in our implementation. So this is a thin film of aluminum that is patterned, in this case, on sapphire. And this cross, cross here is the top plate of this capacitor. And there's a capacitance between the cross and this aluminum ground plane that's all around it. The cross is also connected to that ground plane through two parallel Josephson junctions, which you can see here. And a picture of an object like this was what we were looking at on the last slide. We're able to tune the frequency with this control. We can drive the qubit by placing resonant microwaves down this line. And we also read out through here. We'll take a closer look at those in a minute. If you like, we can look at this in terms of the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian that represents this circuit and it, with a minor simplification. And this, the variable here, which is analogous to the position, if you like, is the superconducting phase, which is the phase difference across the junctions. So we kind of have a kinetic energy term, which depends on the capacitor, and like a potential energy term that depends on the inductor. And if you think about it like that, then you can draw this cosine shaped potential and kind of scope out where the eigenenergies and wave functions are. You have to choose wise parameters to get something like this, but let's just take it at a given that we're able to choose those parameters. In particular, we're interested in these two lowest energy states. Those are going to be our qubit states. And crucially, the energy difference between these two states and the next two states is different. And that's because of this nonlinearity. When we're in the excited state, there's some current flowing through the junctions, so the value of the inductance changes and the frequency changes. That's the basic story of where the nonlinearity comes from. And although these other levels are important and you don't want to forget about them, when we're using a qubit, we just try to pay attention to the lowest two levels. In particular, a very nice experiment, this is sort of a qubit's way of saying hello to you, is to do Rabi oscillations. And this is literally driving a transition back and forth between those lowest two energy levels. So we apply a resonant microwave drive here. This is an AC voltage that just goes down this wire and has some small coupling to the qubit. And we monitor the readout signal of the qubit. I'll talk a bit more about readout in a moment. If we look at that readout signal as a function of the drive amplitude, we see these oscillations where we go from here up to here. We started in the ground state, and here we made it to the first excited state. But what's really nice about a qubit is if you keep driving from the excited state, you actually come back down to the ground state. This is really crucial. This is where the oscillations come from. So we go to the first excited state, back to the ground state, to the first excited state, back to the ground state. And something that's nice about this data is it's our first calibration that we've seen. We'll see more calibrations in this presentation. But if we pick out this amplitude right here with the red line, that's an amplitude for an operation we call a pi pulse, which simply exchanges the amplitudes of the zero state and the one state. And that's a very useful tool to have when you're trying to make a qubit. So I promised you to talk a little bit more about readout. So let's discuss how measuring the qubit state actually works. And in most transmon implementations, uh, the way that this works is to introduce an intermediary. This is a linear resonator. It's just a, a microwave circuit. And it is an intermediary that's coupled to the qubit here. And it's also coupled to the outside world through this wire here. And we're able to send in signals and have them pass by the resonator and come out the other side and measure what comes out in amplitude and phase. What's interesting, as I mentioned, we have this nonlinearity here. If the qubit changes state, that basically changes what this inductance is. And that also affects the frequency of the resonator. So the qubit's frequency kind of changes when it's in a different state. Hence, the resonator's frequency also changes. And it changes enough that we can detect it. So this is how the measurement works. Uh, let's look at this experimental data where we're sending in a signal. The horizontal axis is what is the frequency of that signal. 
and we're measuring what comes out. In particular, let's just look at the phase of the signal that comes out. So if we have the qubit in the ground state, we get this blue trace, and this nice sharp feature here is the resonance. But if we repeat the experiment with the qubit in the one state, the excited state, instead, the resonance shifts over by a few megahertz. And if you look at this nice yellow dotted line here, this is a place where there's a significant difference in the response, depending on if the qubit is in the zero state or the one state. So in order to do the measurement, we will choose this frequency. This is another calibration. We send in a signal at that frequency, and we observe, are we closer to here or closer to here? And that's how we decide if we're in the zero state or the one state. Let's take a look at that in a little more detail with some real, real data here. So suppose we prepare the zero state, and we do this measurement operation, and we do that like a 1,000 times. We, we get magnitude and phase information from each of those shots. So each of these points is from one of those repetitions. And it's plotted in this two-dimensional phase space for the magnitude and phase. We get this kind of cloud. And the size of this cloud is important. And it's related to the noise that we have in our readout chain. And that noise is very important to getting a good readout signal. Now we, re we repeat the experiment. But instead, we prepare the qubit in the one state first. And by the way, the way that we do that is using the pi pulse that we were looking at a few slides ago. And we see that this cloud shifted, and the cloud shifted because the resonance frequency of the resonator moved. And in particular, there's a good separation between these two. So we can draw a dotted line between these two clouds, and that tells us when we do a single measurement, well, if we see something on this side of the line, we think we had zero. And if we saw something on this side of the line, we think we had one. And as you can see, there's a possibility of making a mistake here. There are some red points over here, for example. We'll take a closer look at that later on. So that's the first section. I wanted to give you a flavor of how these superconducting circuits really work. Um, and the next thing that I want to discuss is Sycamore. So let's flash back, you know, think back to four years ago. We were all a bit younger. And this is a state of the art in superconducting circuits. This is a one centimeter square chip. And it has nine of these transmon qubits in a linear chain. It's a 1D array. And what we can observe when we look at this chip is the qubits are a pretty small part of that array. In fact, about half of the chip is taken up by control wiring and readout circuitry. And all this packaging stuff uh, does not look particularly scalable. Okay? So if we're looking at this, the key question that you need to ask yourself four years ago is, how do you scale this up? How on earth are you going to turn this technology into a two-dimensional array with 50 plus qubits? Brute force scaling, copy paste, is not going to do it. So a lot of important inventions and innovations needed to take place. One of those was adopting a two-chip uh, device. So on the left, we have a microscope picture of the device we were just looking at. We have a one-dimensional array on one chip. Now let's identify this blue region here. This is where our qubits are. In fact, qubit fabrication is not that complicated. It's totally feasible to make a two-dimensional array of transmon qubits. But it's a question of how you read them out and how you control the qubits. So let's do this. Let's make a chip whose sole purpose is to have a two-dimensional array of these qubits on it. And then we have a separate chip that's in charge of all of the control stuff. It has the readout. It has all the wires and so forth. And we can have those two chips communicate with each other through a superconducting interconnect. And it's really nice to have a good superconducting interconnect, which I'll, I'll mention a bit more later on. But the key technology here is indium bumps. And these are nice electron microscope pictures showing these in action. You can imagine this bump here is used to connect this pad to another chip so we can transfer signals between the two chips. And indium is a pretty interesting material. It superconducts at a few Kelvin. It's very soft. It's like a solder material. So if we squish two of these bumps together and you do everything just right, uh, you actually get a very nice superconducting connection between the two bumps. And it's also mechanically very robust. Let's take a look at that in real life. So this is a nice photograph. There are actually four chips in this photograph. Okay, One of them is down here. This is the qubit chip. And its sole responsibility is to have this nice little 2 by 3 array of transmon qubits on it. All, all this texture that you see around is a vast array of these indium bumps. In the center is our control chip. And this is responsible for having the readout resonators and control wiring and so forth. It's also responsible for interfacing with the outside world through the perimeter here. So what you do is you take one of these qubit chips. Didn't mean to do that. Take one of these qubit chips and flip it over onto the control chip. You squeeze them together, uh, carefully aligned. And then the result is this assembly that we have at the top here. So this is two chips. This is composed of this chip on top of that chip. Okay? 
Now, one of the really nice things about this flip chip design, besides its scalability, is it makes it, excuse me, it makes a really crucial problem go away. And this is a problem that people usually probably ignore in a seminar like this. But I think you guys deserve to know the truth about crosstalk. So here's the deal with crosstalk. You want to have a bunch of controls for your device, a bunch of biases and microwaves and so on. You want each of those to just do one thing and not mess anything else up. You want your controls to be orthogonal. But that's not really what happens in real life. So let's look at an example from, from my life. Uh, where I had a pretty simple qubit device. This is from my, my PhD work. And we have a, a line here who's responsible for changing the qubit frequency. And we have another line here who's responsible for changing some coupler. Uh, the detail there isn't too important. But what is important is when I put a current through this qubit bias line, it also affects the coupler bias by about 5%. And you know, if you just have a few of these controls like I did, if you have two things, Look, you can just measure this matrix where you can figure out, OK, my flux depends on all these different currents. You measure this matrix, you compensate for it, and you graduate. Move on with your life. And I would encourage all of you to take that to heart. <laughs> but you know, what if you have like 200 controls, which is what we're dealing with with this Sycamore processor? Well, you really need to engineer a new design. I would not suggest trying to brute force your way out of this one measuring some crazy 200 by 200 matrix. And by the way, having limited crosstalk, very small crosstalk, is essential to achieving simultaneous operation with high fidelity. So all of these biases, all these microwave drives, and all these readout lines, it's essential that you have small crosstalk so that you can do a bunch of things at the same time without messing each other up. And we'll revisit simultaneous operation a bit later on. So here's some solutions to this problem. And this is related to the flip chip bonding that I was just talking about. So the first thing that I'll show you is in this microscope picture, we can see all these little squares here that are kind of stamped around. Those are those indium bumps that we were looking at on the last slide. And it turns out that having these very nice, robust ground connections between the two chips is really helpful to having clean microwave engineering so that we can get rid of this crosstalk. And another very nice innovation here is we have a sort of a tunnel made out of superconducting aluminum that goes over our signal traces. That's what's here. And this is an electron microscope image where we're kind of looking at an angle to see what that really looks like. And this is nice because if you imagine we have two chips, these tunnels will shield one chip from another. So we can really diminish crosstalk in that respect. As you can imagine, there's a lot of engineering to getting rid of crosstalk. And we're very fortunate and that we do not have to deal with crosstalk in our daily lives anymore. The next subject that I want to discuss is how qubits couple together. Because, of course, we need to get some interactions and entanglement in order to get our devices to actually work in order to run quantum algorithms. And the simplest way to get two transmons to talk to each other is to literally place them next to each other. It's really nice, really elegant. If we just place these two next to each other, there's naturally a small capacitance between the purple island and the red island. And I've drawn this in this circuit diagram here, this coupling capacitance. And we can also adopt a more simplified diagram uh, where we have the two qubits and just sort of schematically they have this coupling G between them. If you want to play around with this and get a better idea uh, of how this works, you can play with this 2x2 two two matrix. I'm sure you can all diagonalize that. The, the reason that I bring this up is we're going to generalize it a bit uh, in a moment. Now, one feature of this coupling is that it's always on. It's just a, a fact of nature that these two qubits are next to each other and they're sensing each other. And that's something that you have to be careful with when you're trying to build a large system with a lot of qubits that can potentially talk to each other. Because of that, in the Sycamore architecture, we've adopted something called tunable coupling, where instead of it, we adopt a little bit of complication in order to be able to turn off the interactions between neighboring qubits. And it turns out that this was essential to actually making the whole system work, because it's much easier to have a qubit operate when you don't have to worry about what its neighbors are doing. And in particular, we made this work in a scalable two-dimensional architecture where we introduce an extra transmon in between each qubit. We call that a coupler. So in this device layout on the right, we have the 54 qubits. Each of those is a transmon. And then between each pair, there's an extra transmon. And there are 88 of those, and we call them couplers. I want to give you a flavor of the physics of how these work, although, as you can imagine, it gets kind of complicated. Um, the, the trick is that the coupler mediates the interaction between the two qubits. So let's look, have a look at this diagram here. This is the same diagram we had before with an additional element, which is our tunable coupler. And it's at a higher frequency than the qubits. And throughout all of our operation, we're trying to keep it in the ground state. So it isn't really participating directly, 
but it is involved because there's sort of a second order and indirect coupling that's mediated by the coupler. So we have direct coupling and coupl coupling mediated by the coupler. If you want to play around with this and understand it a bit more, this is the three by three matrix you can play with. Uh, but the point is that we can turn the coupling off. There is a special coupler frequency based on all these parameters that can turn off the coupling by canceling out the direct qubit-qubit coupling. And then when we want the qubits to interact deliberately, we can pulse the coupler frequency in order to turn on the interaction for a limited amount of time. Here's an example of some data. So this is resonant swapping data. We have two qubits that are at the same frequency. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to excite one qubit with this pi pulse. And then we're going to have them interact over time. That's the vertical axis of this plot. Sorry, I think that's a little cut off there. And during that time, we're going to try different values for the coupler bias. And that's this horizontal axis. This coupler bias determines the coupler's frequency. What we're looking for is to see if this photon here swaps back and forth between the two qubits. And we can detect that by measuring in the other qubit. So if we see the photon over here, that means that it has swapped over. This is what the data looks like. Uh, here, the coupler is at its maximum frequency, and we see kind of leisurely swapping back and forth between the two qubits. Now let's adjust the coupler bias. This is pushing the coupler frequency down. And we see this rate slow down until we have a divergence here, where there's no swapping at all. That means whatever we do to this qubit, it does not affect this measurement outcome on the other qubit. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for two qubits that are able to, uh, able to act independently without messing each other up. This is where we'll ordinarily operate. But sometimes you do want your qubits to interact because you want that entanglement. In order to do that, we keep going. And over here, there's very strong coupling. You can see how this swapping becomes quite rapid. So we just pulse the coupler over to here for maybe 10 or 20 nanoseconds and then come back after having achieved the interaction that we desired. Speaking of the interaction that we desired, uh, what we want is a two qubit gate. And what we adopted for the quantum supremacy experiment was trying to choose the, the fastest, most high fidelity entangling gate that we could possibly get uh, between our two qubits. And the way that we do that is with resonant gates, so the qubits are at the same frequency, and we pulse the coupling on for about 10 to 20 nanoseconds in order to get an iSwap-like gate between the two qubits. Now, I said iSwap-like. That sounds a little, a little fuzzy. So this is interesting. The interaction between the two qubits includes this resonant swapping, and that would bring about an iSwap gate. But it also includes some conditional phase, which comes from higher energy levels, non-computational levels of the transmon. Now, each of those interactions are entangling, uh, so all is well. But ordinarily, people might be more interested in a specific gate. So let, let's have a look at this gate parameter space over here to get a better idea of what I'm talking about. This vertical axis is how much of an I swap did we do? And this is, we're identifying this angle theta. Here's the identity. And up here in the corner is I swap. The gates that I'm referring to as I swap like that we're using in this supremacy experiment are kind of in this cloud around here. We actually have distributions plotted in the supplementary information if you want to get an idea of what they actually were. The horizontal axis is this conditional phase. So the identity is here. And over here is a controlled Z gate, my favorite gate. Uh, which we want to use for, for error correction in the future. But let me put you at ease with this iSwap light gate. In fact, if we take two of them and some single qubit gates, you can compile a C naught. So this isn't something crazy. It's a nice entangling gate. Uh, it's just a little unorthodox. And moving forward, we have ongoing research into more conventional gates. For example, the, con the control Z gate that I mentioned, which uses an interaction between this computational 1, 1 state in this non-computational 0, 2 state. And in fact, we're able to fill in this whole space. I think John showed the data even two weeks ago, if you saw that, uh, experimentally. We're able to fill this whole space by using a combination uh, of different interactions. And that's still a work in progress. Brooks Foxen is going to graduate soon, and that will be his PhD thesis. Now, suppose I just handed you one of these processors. Uh, unfortunately, that is not enough in order to make it work. And one of the things that we need is really robust hardware infrastructure. So I want to spend a few minutes sharing with you some of the advances that we've made in that regard. And the first thing that I want to talk about is electronics, which is really important. We use electronics to generate the control signals that control and measure our qubits. And we use custom scalable electronics. This is a nice fancy photograph where we can see what's actually on this board. There's a field programmable gate array here. It's kind of in charge of this board. And there are eight digital to analog converters around it that create eight outputs. And these are arbitrary waveforms with frequencies from 0 to 400 megahertz. 
And we can also upconvert them with mixers to microwave frequencies. And that's what we use for readout and for controlling our qubits. And it's very important that this is scalable and low noise. I mentioned scalable. Let's see what it really looks like at scale. So we were looking at one card before. This is a full crate that's spanning the, the width of a standard rack. Um, you can see several cards here. This is enough electronics for about 20 qubits. So if you want to run a larger experiment, well, hook a few racks together, have a couple hundred coaxial cables, and bring them up to your fridge. So the cables are going to come up here and then go down here into the fridge. We use a dilution refrigerator to achieve cryogenic temperatures around 10 millikelvin. And it's really essential to have this cryogenic environment, first of all, because we need the thermal energy of the environment to be small compared to the energy of a single photon, which for our qubits, you know, around 6 gigahertz corresponds to 0.3 kelvin. So we want to be much less than that. And also, we need our aluminum to superconduct because we love those lossless circuit elements. Um, and the critical temperature of aluminum is 1 kelvin. Sorry. Mass was bothering me. Okay. Now, another nuance here is all of our electronics generating these signals are at room temperature, and so there's room temperature noise in them. And we have to get rid of that noise, and we do that with very careful filtering at different temperature stages. For example, you can see these banks of components here. Those are all filters that are trying to get rid of that noise. But when we do readout experiments, we have these very small, very low noise signals at 10 millikelvin, and we need to find a way to get those up to room temperature so that we can get our hands on them and actually measure them. And we do that with staged amplification, where we have quantum limited amplifiers down here at 10 millikelvin, and we also use commercial amplifiers at 3 kelvin. The last part of hardware infrastructure that I want to tell you about is packaging. Now, packaging is everything. If you don't get this right, nothing will work, and it will be very sad. Uh, so uh, the elements here are we have our processor right here, and the, the package is basically everything that goes between the processor and the fridge. So first, we mount the processor in a circuit board, and we have, oh, maybe a thousand wires going around to connect these two together. Then we place this circuit board inside of here. This contains some electromagnetic shielding that goes around the processor to protect it, and it also routes the circuit board into these coaxial connectors. It's around 100 or so coaxial connectors that we can then connect to the outside world. So this is the package, and we bolt this onto the fridge. It's a bit unclear in the photograph, but if you look carefully, you can see a package that looks just like that on the bottom of that fridge with a bunch of cables sticking out of it. So once we have something set up like this, we're basically in business. We have all our hardware set up. And I, I want to share one more lesson about hardware before I move on from this, from this topic. So this is our bristle cone device. This has 72 qubits. This was announced a couple years ago, and it was our first large two-dimensional chip. And this is Sycamore. It has 54 qubits plus these 88 couplers. And this is the device we use to achieve quantum supremacy. And what I want to emphasize is it's not all about the number of qubits. You have to get the whole system to work, and that's an immense challenge. But suppose we have all of that hardware, and it's just laid down at your doorstep. You have all your electronics and your fridge. You're very cold, and you feel great. Uh, it's still very difficult to actually turn all that stuff into a quantum computer. And this next se section is about calibration. Calibration is that process that lets you go from all this stuff to your glorious uh, quantum Fourier transform. Uh, this is some, some Mozart. Uh, it's hard to get from the untuned piano to Mozart. Is what, I'm, is what I'm saying. So this process of calibration is very difficult. We have of order 100 parameters for each of the qubits. We have all these coupler and qubit frequencies we have to pay attention to. Those are all coupled together, so they influence each other. We have to set all these biases properly. We have to come up with all the amplitudes and frequencies and so forth for all of our quantum gates and get the readout to work on all the qubits across the device at the same time. This is daunting. And the way that we make it a little more manageable is by using algorithms. We compose this problem of calibration into a directed graph, where we break it into bite-sized pieces and express the flow that needs to happen in the calibration in terms of dependencies in the graph. Now, this is an example of what that graph looks like for two qubits. Fits on a slide. That's great. Um, although, if you're trying to draw the graph for like 50 qubits, it requires actually thousands of these nodes. And each node represents a physics experiment, along with the analysis and, and algorithms to decide what happened and what we need to do next. 
We can just sort of breeze through this to get an idea of what's going on. We, have, we figure out some device parameters. We do some iteration between single qubit gates and readout. And at the end, we figure out our, our two qubit gates. This is quite a long process, but by having algorithms take care of it, instead of graduate students, everything works much better. So I, I want to give you a flavor of how we actually set up the Sycamore processor. So suppose we have it all cooled down. We have all of our calibration infrastructure. What do we actually do to get this thing to work? Now, the first step, this is a really nice trick, is we want to calibrate each qubit in isolation. And that, this is a great benefit of being able to tune the frequencies of the qubit. So let's say we want to pay attention to this one in the corner here. We will set all the other qubits biases so that they're at very low frequency. Suddenly, the device looks a lot like a single qubit device. And let me tell you, a single qubit device is immensely easier to calibrate than a 50 qubit device, as you can imagine. So we're going to, to bring up this qubit to calibrate it, and we're going to learn information about it. And one piece of information, for example, is we can measure its lifetime as a function of frequency. This is useful to know. So if we look over this about gigahertz frequency range, we can see this lifetime has some fluctuations uh, with frequency. And that's very good to know. We can learn a lot about the qubits in these single qubit configurations. Now we want to choose optimal qubit frequencies. What we're thinking about now is the system where all of the qubits are working together in concert. So this, this is actually a pretty difficult problem. Let, let's say, in an ideal case, we might just place all the qubits at the same frequency. You know, why not? But, well, there are several considerations, so let's kind of march across this. One consideration is we have control noise, and it turns out that that noise is minimized, the effect of that noise is minimized for each qubit when it's at its maximum frequency. So, well, maybe we want to place each qubit at its maximum frequency instead. And there's a little bit of variation in that. That's why this, this color is not uniform here. On the other hand, we really want the qubits to be near their neighbors because we want to interact resonantly. So we don't want them to have to move too far in frequency to do their entangling gates. So, okay, maybe we push all the qubits closer to their neighbors. But you don't really want to be too close because it would be a shame to have some accidental interaction. So actually, it's a little better to have some, some space between your, yourself and your neighbors and your next nearest neighbors. So maybe you get kind of a checkerboard-like pattern. And then you start considering data like this and optimizing over, well, you know, I have a higher lifetime here. I don't really want to be over here, for example. And we take all of these considerations into account with heuristic algorithms to try to come up with a solution like this so that we choose a wise operating frequency for each of the qubits. And now we're ready to set each qubit to those frequencies and carry out calibrating the actual whole device together. And as I was trying to convey earlier, this is a very complicated process, but I want to give you a flavor of how it works by looking at a few waypoints along the way. So you remember our friend, the Robbie oscillations. Uh, this is that uh, calibration we used to determine our pi pulse amplitude back in the beginning, where we're oscillating back and forth between the zero state and the one state. Uh, so this is actually the same data that we looked at before. That was for this qubit. And we take the same data across the whole device. You can see some interesting diversity here, but we have sufficient, uh, sufficiently robust algorithms so that we're able to select a nice pi pulse amplitude for all of the qubits. And of course, we really want to iterate back and forth between the readout and the single qubit gates to tune it all in, but this is just giving you an idea of what it looks like. Speaking of readout, that's the other really essential ingredient that we want to bring up for each of the qubits. So this is the same data we were looking at before. It's the same qubit here. And you'll remember this experiment. We prepared the zero state, and we kind of got this cloud here. We prepared the one state instead and got this cloud over here. And when you're doing experiments like this, you need to figure out, OK, what's the optimal frequency where I want to do the measurement? What's the optimal power to use? How does this affect the other qubits? There's kind of a lot going on. But at the end of the day, after a lot of um, robust algorithms and hard work, uh, we can get nice readout clouds across the whole device. And finally, let's touch on our two qubit gate. So this is actually the calibration that was used to do the two qubit gates in the supremacy experiment for this iSwap-like gate. So what we want is for a, a photon to swap from one qubit to a neighboring qubit. And the probability of that happening is the vertical axis here. And during the experiment, we just tune what coupler pulse amplitude do we need. So down here on the left, we have small coupling, so no swap is happening. And as we turn up the coupling, we get a swap. But if you turn up the coupling too high, it actually swaps there and back again. So we need to pick the right value, which is where this red vertical line is. And now, this plot is kind of interesting. We've been looking at plots of 53, uh, 53 plots for 53 qubits. But here, this, these light squares actually represent the qubits. There are 53 of those. 
but there are 86 plots. And there are 86 plots because there's a plot for each pair of qubits. It really adds up, uh, but you can see that they all look pretty uniform and everything is working very well. So suppose we have this calibrated system. We would really like to be able to assess how well we did. What is the performance of the device? And that's what the final section of this presentation is going to be about. It's about benchmarking and how we can come up with data like this. I'll talk about this in two separate parts. The first will be about readout, and then we'll talk about gates afterwards. So readout. You all remember the readout clouds. I think you're all friends with these uh, by now. But the question that we have from a benchmarking point of view is how often do we get the wrong answer? So suppose we are looking at just the zero state data. We see that about 1% of the time, even though we prepared the zero state, we thought we had the one state. So that looks like an error. And for the one state here, we see about 4% of the time, we think we saw the zero state. So that's an error too. There's a reason that these two are asymmetric. That's because the qubit has a finite lifetime. And during the course of the measurement, it's natural for it to decay from the one state to the zero state, maybe a couple of percent. This is an example of where a longer lifetime is beneficial. But there's a confounding factor here, which is state preparation error, because although the qubits are very cold, there is still some finite thermal population in the qubit at equilibrium in the excited state. In fact, most of this is probably just the fact that the qubit was in a mixed state that had about 1% in the excited state. So this is, in fact, not really readout error at all, but really state preparation error. And these confounding factors are something to pay attention to when you're trying to do a benchmark like this. There's room for improvement here. Like I, I mentioned, for example, a longer lifetime would help. And there can also be optimization of the readout circuit itself, which we're, which we're working on. And it would be nice if we had this error around 1%. Uh, and that's something that has been achieved in smaller devices. And we're working on upgrading that technology so it can work at scale. This is one qubit, though. And this presentation is kind of about making the whole system work. So OK, benchmarking readout on the system sounds kind of hard. But how about two qubits? Let's just benchmark two qubits read out at the same time. So we're going to generalize this clouds experiment for the four states associated with two qubits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And we expect some errors to happen because we know that each qubit on its own has some readout error. But what we're interested in is if there is any correlated error, any excess error, error from things like interactions or crosstalk or problems in your amplifiers or readout chain. So this is some experimental data. We have two qubits. These left four panels are where we're measuring qubit A. And in the right four panels, we're measuring qubit B. Uh, in the top two, qubit A is in the ground state. In the bottom two, it's in the excited state. And in the left, B is in the ground state. And in the right, B is in the excited state. We can come up with these errors and put them in this table. And we can also compute what error we expect based on the single qubit measurements. And for example, I've colored in red here a couple of these where there's a bit of excess error of order 1%, which is a result of measuring the two qubits simultaneously instead of just one at a time. And this is the kind of thing that you need to track down and mitigate in order to get a whole system to work. But as you can see, there's a bit of an explosion here in the amount of data that we need to benchmark a number of qubits instead of just the one. We already have eight plots we're looking at here. And this is going to get out of hand quite quickly if we're trying to benchmark a full system of, say, 53 qubits. In fact, 2 to the 53 is about 10 to the 16 different states. So it's just not going to happen. We're not going to generalize the readout clouds experiment to this level. Instead, we're going to try sampling a random selection of those 10 to the 16 states, maybe a couple hundred of them. And for each of those states, we're going to repeatedly prepare and measure the state and record all the bit strings that we come up with. So let's look at an example for an eight qubit case. Suppose we choose this bit string. So we're going to do some pi pulses on some of these qubits to prepare this state. And then we're going to measure all the qubits simultaneously. And we'll get outcome bit strings. For example, here are three measurements that we might get from three different experiments. You can see in the first one, we got one bit wrong. And if we count up the number of ones, we're sort of missing one photon. That's good to know. The second one, we actually got it right. Nice work. And in the third one, there are two bits that are wrong. But it was a 0 and a 1 that are wrong, so it sort of looks like there are 0 missing photons. And this is what's plotted on the right. This Hamming distance is the number of bits that you got wrong. Of course, you want that to be 0. And this vertical axis is the difference between the number of measured photons and the number that you were supposed to have. And again, we want that to be 0. So here, this is about 20%. Actually, the most likely outcome is that we lose one photon and get that one bit wrong. Um, and you can see this very nice color pattern. This is the probability, outcome probability on a log scale. 
It's a very nice pattern. And this tells us about how the device is performing, what the biases are in the errors, and how well we're doing in terms of measuring all of the qubits simultaneously. That was a readout. The next thing that I want to discuss is benchmarking quantum gates. And this is a bit challenging, in fact. So we were just talking about measuring readout errors of order 1% or so. But we want our gate errors to be more like 10 to the minus 3, which is significantly less than the other errors in readout, for example. So it's kind of hard to measure. And the solution to this problem is to amplify the error by having a long sequence of gates so that each gate is contributing a little bit of error, and it all adds up in a way that we can actually measure it. And there's a wide variety of techniques in this kind of benchmarking using long sequences of gates. And I'm just going to touch on the methods that we're using in our paper, but know that there's a lot of research going on worldwide on this, on this very subject. So suppose we want to look at just single qubit gates. Here we have a, a collection of three single qubit gates. These are pi over two pulses, which are like pi pulses, but half as much. Um, and the, the only difference between these is they have different phases. So they're sort of rotating about different axes in the block sphere, if you like. And we can make a random sequence of these where we start out in the ground state, we do a randomly selected sequence, and then we measure the qubit at the end. We also generalize this to two qubit gates. So suppose we have kind of an arbitrary two qubit gate. We remember these parameters theta and phi from, from way back when. They might parameterize the gate. We want to benchmark that gate. So what we do is we make a random sequence where we interleave randomly selected single qubit gates. It's kind of in layers where we have a layer of single qubit gates and then our two qubit gate, and a layer of single qubit gates and our two qubit gate, and so forth. Then we can measure both of the qubits at the end. And the length of the sequence we call the depth. What we want to know is how well are we doing as a function of depth, and how well we're doing is fidelity. This is answering the question, did we do the right thing? Which is something to ask yourself in your daily life. And the method that we use to assess that is cross entropy. So we measure a probability distribution uh, by repeatedly sampling the output of the circuit. And that's tractable up to around 10 qubits. You start to run out of runway at 10 qubits because this takes of exponentially many repetitions, exponential in the number of qubits. So uh, it starts to really get out of hand. But up to 10, you can totally get a probability distribution. Then what we want to do is compare to the ideal probabilities that we can simulate or calculate. Because we know the circuit that we ran, so we can calculate what we wanted to get at the end. So this is an example from an experiment with five qubits, where we have some experimental probabilities, which are the blue bars. And then we have these calculated or ideal probabilities, which are the, the red dots. And you can see that these two distributions are well correlated with each other. But we want a way of quantifying that. And a really nice way of quantifying how close our two probability distributions is called the cross entropy. Uh, this is the definition of the cross entropy. It's the sum of p log q. And we can use the cross entropy to estimate the fidelity, which is quantifying how well are we doing. It's just a linear relationship. This is a really powerful technique, in fact. So let's focus on the case where we're benchmarking two qubit gates for a moment. Uh, it turns out that there are a few bonuses, a few tricks that we can play with this cross entropy data in order to get a lot of very valuable information. So let me try to explain a couple of those to you. Here's an experimental sequence. First of all, we choose some sequences. These are randomly selected sequences uh, that we want to run on our processor. So we maybe have a family of these. I think typically maybe we do 20 of these. Then we're going to collect the experimental probabilities for each of those sequences. So we're just going to do that one time. We run each of the sequences maybe a few thousand times and come up with these probabilities. Step three is to simulate what we expect to come out of these circuits. What probability distributions do we expect? But this is a trick. We're trying to figure out what is the unitary model for our two qubit gate. So we'll start off with a guess, sort of a placeholder, and that'll be our starting point. And then we can compute this fidelity, which depends on the probabilities that we measure and the probabilities that we should have gotten. What's interesting is we can then have a feedback loop where we go back and forth simulating circuits with different unitaries. And we optimize over that unitary to find the one that maximizes the fidelity. What that means is this unitary model is the one that best express expresses what we were actually doing uh, in our experiment. This is really great to know. Um, let's look at an example with some data. So suppose we're doing CZ gates. I mentioned CZ is my favorite gate. And we might have a sequence that looks like this, where we have some single qubit gates and interleaved control Z gates. This is what the unitary is supposed to look like. We get a minus sign on the 1, 1 state. Okay? 
And as a function of circuit depth, we see this fidelity, which we compute from the cross entropy, goes down in an exponential way. And from this exponential decay, we can infer how much error is associated with each of the gates. But suppose we were a little more lax and we weren't so sure, maybe we weren't doing precisely a CZ. Maybe we were doing something a little bit different. So we use this fitting procedure to try to find what is the unitary that best explains the data. And you can see it's very close to the unitary we were looking at before, but you know, this phase is a little bit different. We have a little bit of swapping that's happening. And when we do this, and we use this best fit unitary instead of the one with just the CZ unitary, this fidelity goes up. And the reason the fidelity goes up is because the model we're using to predict the probabilities more accurately reflects what is actually happening in the experiment. Colloquially, you could say this is learning what we did. What was the two qubit unitary we were actually doing? And if you're trying to do something like a CZ, and you're actually doing this, it would be really nice to know what that is. So this is very valuable information if you're trying to do something like tune up a specific two qubit gate. And this is a class of error that's called coherent error. When you're doing a quantum operation, it might be a very nice quantum operation, but it's not the one you're looking for. There's another bonus, and an, I might apologize here, this is going to get a bit in the benchmarking weeds, so this might be just for the benchmarking enthusiasts in the audience. This is something called speckle purity, which is really fun, really delightful. So I was just talking about coherent error. There's another thing that's incoherent error, and this is error that takes our density matrix toward a mixed state. So it's depolarizing error. It's not what we want. It's something that happens, for example, from energy loss in the qubits. And you're familiar with this density matrix. Of course, the trace of rho squared is less than or equal to 1, and it equals 1 in the case that you have a pure state. That's what we want is a pure state. But it decreases as you uh, go through incoherent error. Now, one path to figuring out this, this error is to actually measure the density matrix. That sounds OK, but you know, measuring the density matrix is kind of a big pain. It scales exponentially. We have an exponential number of sequences that we have to execute. And for each of those sequences, we have to do an exponential number of repetitions. So it's very data intensive. But we had an interesting observation. So let's take a look at this data here. This is two qubit benchmarking data. This is like the raw probabilities, where each pixel is a probability for a specific state, a specific circuit, and a specific depth. And we have this whole array of pixels here. On the left side, you can observe it's kind of speckly, right? There's something kind of going on here. But on the right, as we go to deeper depth circuits where we've done a large number of operations, it gets kind of smeared out and smooth. It's kind of uniform. This is very similar to a laser speckle, uh, where if you reflect a laser off of a rough surface, you'll get bright and dark points called speckle. And where it's bright actually depends on the microscopic details of the thing you're reflecting off of. But it's a result of interference. And that's what we're seeing here. On this left side, we have something good happening. We have quantum interference happening in our algorithms. But on the right side, it doesn't seem to matter which algorithm you're even running. You just get the same answer every time, which is this uniform probability distribution. Believe it or not, the purity of the state is actually proportional to the variance of these probabilities. If we take a slice through this, this gives us a collection of probabilities. We take the variance of that. That is proportional to the purity. Uh, which is amazing. So this means that this purity information was actually hiding inside our cross-entropy data all along, and we can get it for free. And just to show you with some distributions, these are uh, integrated histograms or cumulative distributions showing these probabilities. On the left side, we have this nice broad distribution of probabilities, which is what we expect for a pure or approximately pure state when we have a bunch of random circuits. But on the right, everything's just clustered around a quarter probability, which is what you would get for the maximally mixed state. OK, so if there are any benchmarking non-enthusiasts out there, I apologize if, if this wasn't too diverting. But actually, this is very nice for trying to figure out what's going on with our gates in an efficient way. There's one more thing here, which is what if we wanted to do cross-entropy with a large number of qubits? I'm mostly focusing on benchmarking one or two qubits at a time. But maybe we want to do a full system test where we're generating entanglement across the full device. Uh, this might sound familiar to you. Now, if we have two to the 50 different states. As I said, it's really difficult. It's, it's basically impossible to try to figure out what is a probability distribution associated with those states. In fact, if you have a quantum computer like this and you run a random circuit over and over, you run it all day long, you're not even going to see the same bit string twice because the probability is so vanishingly small. So you can't get the probability distribution. But what you can get is maybe a million or so samples. So these are a million bit strings, just integers, that you can get when, from measurement results from your machine. 
And if you take more samples, you'll be able to estimate the fidelity with, with less uncertainty. What we do is for each of these samples that we observe, we compute what is the probability that we expect to be associated with that bit string. And basically, if you're seeing a lot of bit strings that are supposed to have high probability, if you're seeing unusually many high probability bit strings, it suggests that you're actually doing something good. You're actually running the algorithm with some fidelity. That, that's the essence of how, this, of how this works. And we can use these probabilities to estimate the cross entropy. So this is the same expression for cross entropy we saw before. We're basically averaging over our observation probabilities. Well, we don't have those anymore, but we do have our observations, so we can average over our observations instead. And you can quantify the error bars on this in order to get confidence to see how well you're doing. There's a bit of a nuance here because we want to compute this ideal probability, and we have 50 plus qubits. That starts sounding kind of hard. And this is a connection to quantum supremacy that uh, I will leave at that for any benchmarking nerds who are making that connection. But the, the essence is that we have this uh, benchmarking task that becomes very difficult for, for a lot of qubits. The final thing is simultaneous operation. I mentioned this earlier on. We really want to have a device where we can run arbitrary gates on arbitrary qubits at arbitrary times. We don't want the qubits to have to wait in line and go one at a time trying to execute an algorithm. For one thing, in the NISC era, where we have noisy circuits and there's error associated with each operation, there's also error associated with waiting around. And so it's very difficult to try to get something good to happen in a NISC circuit if you have to do gates one at a time. Also, for error correction, it's necessary to have simultaneous operations. So this is a very important thing to be able to do with a real quantum processor. So what we're going to do is run single qubit benchmarking on all of the qubits, so they'll each get their own circuit that we're going to run, but they all do them together at the same time. Nominally, they're not interacting with each other, but if they are interacting with each other, that'll show up as error, which we'll be able to measure and quantify. We also want to do this with all of the pairs simultaneously. Although you'll see this asterisk here, it's not really possible to do all the pairs at once because each qubit participates in more than one two-qubit gate. So the way that we do this is we split it up into different layers. Here are eight different patterns, for example. And suppose we choose pattern A. I want to benchmark all of those two-qubit gates simultaneously. Well, I'll choose a two-qubit circuit for each of the pairs, very similar to the ones we were doing when we benchmarked one pair at a time. And I will execute all of those circuits on all of those pairs simultaneously and measure the results. And then for each pair, we can pick out its results and do the same analysis. Finally, these are the results for these benchmarks that we run on Sycamore. And this is straight out of our paper. Uh, on the left are probability or distributions showing the data distributed across the whole device. And in this table, we can kind of see a summary for it. So the first line is the single qubit error. And what's really nice here is when we go from the isolated case to the simultaneous case, there's only a marginal increase in the error. And this suggests there's not microwave crosstalk. The qubits aren't interacting with each other when we don't want them to. It's very important that this works well. For the two qubit case, we see a more significant but still modest increase in the error. And we're happy to still be under 1% for this average error here. And there's another note about the two qubit gates. In fact, the unitaries of the two qubit gates actually change slightly because of things like crosstalk and unwanted interactions between different pairs that are nominally independent. So we measure that and take it into account in our experiment. And the last line here is the readout. We can see a modest increase in the readout error. But as I mentioned, this is something that we're actively working on getting better. This is a map showing the spatial distribution of all of these errors for these single qubit simultaneous uh, errors and these two qubit simultaneous errors. This is just a really cool figure. Uh, this basically shows that the thing works, and it's something that we're really proud of. So let me conclude. Uh, I went over these four areas. First was superconducting qubits. I wanted to give you a flavor for how transmons work and what the data looks like when you're using one. Second, I talked about Sycamore. And, and crucially, we included here a lot of the hardware infrastructure that really makes it possible to run one of these big experiments at scale. And it's really a lot of work to get all of this to work. Third, we looked at calibration, which is that process that we use to go from all of our hardware to a working quantum computer where you can write a program and actually run it. And finally, we looked at benchmarking, which is how we assess how well we're performing at a system level. So let me finish by thanking again this huge team. I'm really proud to be a part of this team and to get to share these results with you today. And thank you all very much. <laughs>
Good question. The last qubit totally worked. Uh, however, I mentioned that packaging is really hard and really important. In fact, there was a problem with the microwave connection in the package, so we were able to tune that qubit's frequency. We could see that it was there, but we were not able to do, for example, a pi pulse to it. So we just left it out of the experiment. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so um, I had a question about uh, readout fidelity versus gate fidelity. So I imagine that it's probably hard to distinguish uh, when you're uh, doing the, you know, the readout plots, whether that uh, comes from readout error or whether that comes from, say, gate error when you're doing a pi pulse from That's a great question, and it, it also relates to what I was mentioning about state preparation error, where if the qubit has some finite excited state population in equilibrium, that also confounds this readout experiment. Um, to really address your question, what you need is confidence. Um, what we're going to do later on in the sequence is benchmark the single qubit gates, and there we see consistently error at the 10 to the minus 3 level. So if we're looking at readout errors around 10 to the minus 2, we can acknowledge like the pi pulse isn't perfect, but it is really good. That's right. That's a great question, Michael. So uh, in principle, calibrating one of these processors is a constant time problem. It's of order one, which is great. Uh, but in real life, it's really hard to do that. Uh, the way that it can be a constant time problem is if you're able to do calibrations across the device in parallel. Maybe you're not calibrating every single qubit at the same time, but you can pick out uh, subsets of them to calibrate in parallel. And then if you make the system twice as big, you're just doing twice as much in parallel. Um, that's something that we did not do here, but that would be really cool. Uh, you mentioned this thermal population. Is that uh, what you would expect from the bulk distribution at 10 millikelvin, or is it going to be hotter than what you created that? Excellent question. Uh, it is not what you would expect from a Boltzmann dist distribution at 10 millikelvin. It's more like 40 or 50 millikelvin, I think. And the reason for that that we can explain, like there's this discrepancy. Um, if you have a thermometer that's bolted to this copper plate, it says 10 millikelvin. But there's a question of what is the temperature of the electronics noise that's actually incident on the qubits going in through these coaxial cables. So it's a bit different. Those don't show up on a thermometer, but they are able to excite a qubit. And carefully managing that noise with filtering like this is very important. Yes, you're right. I mean, whenever you're trying to make a decision like that about an architecture, you have to consider the full system and how you build a big scalable device. And in this case, we were able to do it uh, with the architecture that we chose, and anything else would require a redesign. Yes, so th there's kind of a fun story in, um, in the research progression that we got uh, toward the device that we have now. It's, it's almost like we're systematically eliminating uh, materials and avoiding material science in order to make this device actually work so that everything is just aluminum and silicon and vacuum and indium. Um, however, new materials and developments in materials are really going to be essential to getting processors to work at a larger scale and with lower error rates. So we think materials research is really important. So you, you quickly glossed over the 7 qubit to the Vista Gorky. So can you, can you tell me like what is the problem and what did you learn from uh, like looking at that device? Sure. We learned a lot. It was very valuable to have that because, for example, all this calibration infrastructure where we try to calibrate a bunch of qubits on a big device, in fact, building out all the infrastructure in the fridge and the electronics and so on, we developed all of that for Bristlecone and then we're able to feed it forward to the next generation of devices. Um, Bristlecone worked. Um, all of the qubits worked well. 
It's just a question of trying to bring up a two-dimensional array where all of the qubits are working together in concert. And in particular, in Bristlecone, we had fixed coupling between all of the qubits. So you, always, you have this always-on interaction with your four neighbors, and this spreads across the whole device. And it's very difficult to operate like that with high fidelity. I don't, yeah, I don't want a million coaxes into the fridge. Um, it's something where I don't, I fear I don't have too much to add, but I can emphasize that you're right, that that is an immense challenge. There will be a lot of difficult engineering challenges and innovations that will be necessary to be able to have a million qubits. If we look at this here, where this thing is basically full of coaxial cables, and I wouldn't want to push this more than, I wouldn't want to push this much further, let me put it that way. Yes, that would be great. Um, right now, we're, we're just dealing with the, the hardware that we do have. Um, in principle, if everything were more identical, then we can make more assumptions in the calibration process and, and streamline things. How many coaxes are there going in the fridge? It's about 200. Great question. We have some data in the supplement where we look at the fidelity of how the, the full algorithm's fidelity drifts over time. This is kind of a 10-hour time scale sort of thing, um, but you can look at the plots. Something that's nice about casting the calibration problem in terms of this graph is we're able to sort of put a timeout on various graph components, and some things last longer than others. So for example, the qubits are frequency tunable, and there's low frequency noise on that flux bias, which can shift the qubit frequencies around. But with a quick experiment on each qubit, we can measure that and fix it. Uh, so those calibrations will t time out more often, and we can go through and maintain the calibrations. Are there any efforts to use the current processor to do like many body quantum simulations? Um, I don't know about many, quanti many body quantum simulations per se, but we're working on trying to do more algorithms beyond quantum supremacy. I'm afraid I was not maximally clear there. Uh, in fact, we are averaging over an ensemble of random circuits. A typical number is maybe 20. So in those plots I had with the exponential decay, each of those data points is averaged over about 20 circuits. So in that case, how could you possibly distinguish coherent versus incoherent bias? That's a great question. So the first step is we ask, what is the incoherent error? And the way that we can do that is by measuring the purity of basically the, the length of the block vector, if you will, as a function of the depth. I, I talked about a trick to do that, but you could in principle use tomography to figure out exactly what the quantum state is and then look at how the purity of that state decays as a function of depth. That alone tells you what is the incoherent error associated with each gate. So you can kind of put that in the bank. And now we move on to this other experiment where we're trying to look at the coherent error, which is asking the question, are we doing the right unitary, or what unitary are we doing? So we can use these techniques to try to fit to the data to see what unitary do we think best explains the data. And the difference between that unitary and the one that we desire, you could call coherent error. So in that way, we can kind of separate the two. It's very useful to have that information when you're trying to debug and make performance better. Not necessarily. Uh, the, the good news is, if you have enough instances of random circuits, um, you can get a pretty robust solution. Uh, we haven't really had a problem with that. Last question, maybe? Last question. 
Sure. So besides besides the calibration challenges and sort of the plumbing for all the signals and, and whatnot, are there any other operational challenges that you guys are anticipating as you sort of scale up and put it into production? Um, are you t talking about like a big error corrected machine? Um, I'm not sure that I have a very good comment on that, um, but once you're getting to that level, basically everything that we've developed for this is starting to break. Um, so we need to kind of reforge everything. And in addition to the things that you mentioned, one of the very important ones is software infrastructure. Uh, this is crucial, and it's one of the things that I really appreciated about working here, is we have a lot of very professional software developers, so we're able to kind of do everything right, do everything the right way. Um, and scalable software is very important and something that's easy to overlook in a hardware experiment. All right. So yeah. thanks for coming. Thank you.